You're watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Saturday afternoon, joined by the Reverend Dr. Uh, Richard Price, who is returning to our show to talk about the Council of 869 and the Photian Councils in general. He recently published a translation of the Acts of 869 through 870, so the Council of Constantinople there. I did put a link to it in the description, so y'all go and purchase a copy if you haven't already. <laughs> I, I know so, uh, some of y'all have already purchased a copy and are really waiting for uh, this interview and are excited, so we're, we're going to dive in. Uh, Father Price, how are you? It's great to have you back on. Yes, I know, in good form, delighted. Uh, always delighted if I to find an audience who actually want to hear about these councils. There, there are plenty of people who want to hear about it. This is one of the things that I hear very often. People ask questions about 869, its status, the council at, in 879, and also its status, Photius and his relationship to the Catholic Church, all kinds of things. So we're going to we're gonna hopefully be able to get into all that. But before we do, let's maybe just kind of set up the historical context. Can you tell us what exactly led to the council in 869 to 870 in Constantinople? Yes, now uh, this gets a little fiddly, um, and I'll try and put it uh, in as digestible form as I can. Um, now, in uh, 858, uh, there's a coup, political coup in Constantinople, and uh, the patriarch Ignatius is deposed, and Photius, a very leading member of the, um, well, the, the, the lay intelligentsia and the government circles uh, was uh, chosen as his successor. Well, Pope Nicholas I, uh, Saint Nicholas, a, a very strong figure, rather a terrifying figure, I think, uh, regards this as entirely improper. The deposition of a patriarch for no proper grounds had been communicated to him, and the election of him in his place of a layman. And so he wouldn't accept Photius. And uh, Roman Council in 863 declared Photius deposed and excommunicated. Well, in 867, Photius retaliated by having a synod in Constantinople that declared Pope Nicholas himself deposed mm. and excommunicated. But in the very same year, just a few months later, uh, the emperor was murdered. A new emperor appears on the throne and he reverses the position. He has Photius deposed, and he reinstates Patriarch Ignatius. So it's Byzantine politics caused the, the sudden swings to Photius being chosen to replace Ignatius, and now Ignatius being reinstated, Photius pushed out. And then the council was heard in order to deliver formal ecclesiastical judgment against Photius, and uh, achieve and celebrate a new reconciliation between Byzantium and Rome after a schism between them of a particularly shocking kind. I think that's enough as you can expect people can, di can, can to digest. <laughs> and can I ask a follow-up question about oh, yes. something you said there? You mentioned 867 where mm. um, Photius you know, attempts to depose the Pope. Um, my my understanding is the Pope died before um, he had heard of that council. Is that correct? That's true. Yes. Okay. So this wasn't effectively something that was received in the West, um, I would imagine then. So what, what was the reaction to that council? I'm just curious. What was the reaction in Rome to that? So to what council? The... To 867, whenever they did catch wind uh -huh. of what Photius did there, what was the reaction? Uh, in the West, I, I, I don't know, honestly. Okay. I, no I problem. No problem. That. Yes. Mm. No problem. Well, let, let's talk about the condemnation of mm. 869 at 879. This is where it gets a little more confusing because we have multiple councils going on here. Yes. So 
let's talk about 879 to 880 and also how did the acts of this council survive? Can you maybe go into that? Yes, well, um, the reason for hopping on immediately to 879, and we'll be going backwards and obviously mm -hmm. going back to council 8670, but simply at this point, I think I'd like to say something about the um, survival of the acts. Um, so, 877, Patriarch Ignatius dies, and Photius is reappointed, restored as Patriarch. And the Eastern churches, that's the uh, within the Byzantine Empire, but also the Oriental Patriarchates, uh, immediately accepted him and condemned the Council of 869 to 70. Now, how did the Pope react? Well, John VIII, this is, uh, a more cautious, not as bold a personality as Nicholas I, and he um, acquiesced in it because he desperately needed Byzantine help against the Saracens, mm. Muslims who were invading uh, not only Sicily, also southern Italy. And in mm. fact, the um, imperial fleet and army was extremely successful pushing them back uh, in the same year that the council is actually, actually finally held. So um, they feel that in order to um, undo the work of this earlier mm -hmm. council with econ ecumenical claims, that they need a new council and that was held, attended by papal legates. Um, this council, yes, it uh, formally accepted Foch. Well, rather, Foch has already been fully accepted in the East. And the um, Roman legates who arrived in 879 said, now, because of the Roman condemnation of Foch, they didn't talk so much about the council of 869-70, because the popes have condemned him, he remains condemned, so the point of this council is to retract that condemnation, to which the Easterners replied, rubbish, uh, we, we don't accept that, that condemnation. We regarded Photius as patriarch for, for ages. So that was a slightly tense situation. Mm. Anyhow, so um, yes, that council met and um, condemned the council of 869 to 70, just 10 years after it had been held. And um, uh, natural corollary of that was burning all copies of its acts. Now, how did a copy survive? Well, the Roman legates, after immediately after the Council of 869 to 70, had set off in a ship across the Adriatic to uh, back to Italy with copies of the Acts. On the way, they were caught by pirates. Um, the emperor, the Byzantine emperor, failed to provide them with a sort of some ships to protect them, which made Rome suspicious that uh, <laughs> um, that uh, Byzantium and the pirates were in league. Anyway, uh, so these poor people get uh, cap taken prisoner for some months, and the, all their documents are confiscated. How did the act survive? Because towards the very end of the council. The, that uh, important Roman uh, uh, diplomat and scholar, translator, uh, Anastasius, the librarian, happened to go to Constantinople, not because of the council, but as part of a Frankish delegation to arrange um, a marriage between the Frankish princess and, uh, uh, and, uh, Byza uh, and, and prince in Byzantium. So he happened to be in Constantinople. And as a good church historian, he thought, oh, we shall have this council. So he got hold of a copy of the Acts, and he got back with them safely to Rome, where he translated them. And this translation was very fortunately preserved and, so, and, and has come down to us. So there we are. We have a, a very reliable a Latin translation. Uh, there is... A, um, there is selective Greek record that survives, but I found it was pretty useless. Not only is it very much abbrevi 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 abbreviated, but it doesn't simply abbreviate the text. It sometimes simplifies it and paraphrases it. So even when you've got a Greek text, 
um, you have no confidence that was the actual genuine original Greek text in front of Anastasius. So it's, yeah. that's an unusual story, which I want yeah. to get in at this stage. So I've got this evidence. So if the librarian had, had not gone to Constantinople, we would not have records we of this We certainly would day. not. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, no. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay, so let, let's talk about 879 overturning mm. 869. I've heard different views on this. I've heard from some that 879 just entirely overturns 869. It's just seen as just completely a redo. Whereas I've seen others say, well, no, 879 is just partially overturning 869. Um, and, and, and so that's why, in fact, it could be held as an ecumenical council by Catholics today, because it's not entirely overturned. It was just the issues relating to Photius that were overturned. Could you talk about that? Um, I, I think that's that is an artificial distinction. Mm. No, the um, um, the Roman legates at the Council of eight seven nine to eighty went together with a um, um, well, it's a sort of general terms, a sort of condemnation of the rejection of the decisions of the previous council. Um, and the fact is that, of course, the 86970 Council, now this is a curious fact. Mm -hmm. um, when the legates, Roman legates in 870 got back to Rome, well, they're pretty annoyed at Byzantium not having protected them against pirates. But there was another more substantial reason why Rome was feeling, in feeling um, uh, out of sorts with Byzantium, and that is over Bulgaria. Now, mm. I mean, this is something that wasn't discussed at the council proper, though there were some meetings at the end involving people on both sides. Um, it, the question was that Bulgaria had just adopted the Christian religion. Should it be under Rome or Constantinople? And, and, and both Rome and Constantinople made, laid claim to it. Um, and because uh, Constantinople... Um, continued to send Greek bishops there and, and uh, didn't recognize Roman jurisdiction there, uh, Rome never in fact formally approved the decrees of 870. Mm. Um, it was only centuries later, which I shall talk about later on, I think, uh, that, um, that Rome dug up this council, mm. you know, dusted mm. its copy and, and started describing it as the eighth ecumenical council. So this is way after the fact. Way after, yes. So I, I would then imagine in that case that um, there there were people on both sides of East and West that did not see this as ecumenical at that time. No. I mean, um, mm. in, in the West, it would have been dependent entirely on whether Rome uh, adopted it as uh, well, whether Rome adopted it, yes, as an authoritative council that expressed the, the voice of Rome. Remote in the West, it's mm -hmm. not ecumenical councils in themselves. Mm -hmm. It's it's the voice authority of the Pope that is the decisive um, mm -hmm. determinant of what is considered orthodoxy. And and there wasn't any evidence that um, the Pope at that time had ratified it. Uh, but, no, I mean, this has to okay. be discussed. The, the right. evidence is a bit unsatisfactory, but it, the, yeah. yes, the conclusion myself and my collaborators was no, that Rome did not at any stage um, give its uh, approval to the, to yeah. the, to the, to the council. It, of course, it, it approved the council's chief work of deposing, uh, condemning Phocius, mm -hmm, but, it, mm -hmm. it, but it wasn't um, ready to, to, out of resentment towards Byzantium, it wasn't ready to give the council its uh, formal approbation. Oh, okay, I see. Be because it just seems odd that you would go and send legates over to have this mm. council, go through the whole motion, and then yes. just not ratify it. <laughs> yes, but I say things had changed, but it, yeah. it, because because of the um, uh, the um, dis disagreement over Bulgaria had blow, mm -hmm. blow up 
blew up during the council. You mm -hmm. see, this is this was that a makes sense. problem. Hmm. So let's talk about the nature of the council itself. Was it merely disciplinary, or was it also doctrinal? I've I've kind of heard uh, mixed reviews of it. So where where do you weigh in on that? Well. Now, a council to a full ecumenical status, does it have to define doctrine? Now, if, uh, if you or anyone else remember what I was saying about the Council of Ephesus, the 431, mm -hmm. that council was recognized as ecumenical very soon after, certainly from the time of Chalcedon. But it didn't actually define any doctrines. Mm -hmm. And by the mid-6th century, when it was agreed that the ecumenical council must define doctrine, this was an embarrassment. And so that the um, it was soon claimed that, that Ephesus formally defined that Our Lady is Theotokos, Mother of God, when in fact it hadn't. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, the council clearly believed that. There was no formal definition. Right. So in 869 to 70, there was no doctrinal matter that really needed to be tackled. But it but in order to give the council full ecumenical status, they had to <laughs> concoct something about doctrine. What they did was to drag up the iconoclast controversy again. Mm. And they found a small, rather pathetic group of iconoclasts in Byzantium who were paraded before the council and condemned. And uh, that was an attempt to say, yes, we are not exactly defining, doc well, not redefining, I might say. Uh, what we say is, if doc is of doctrinal significance. Um, the, the work of the council was condemning Photius, um, dealing with a rather, uh, the problem of what about bishops who had been uh, consecrated, ordained by Photius, or bishops ordained before Photius by Ignatius, but had then gone over to Photius. And the, and the council, under, you know, this was the demand of the um, papal legates backed up by the emperor, de declared that all these bishops. Uh, should, were deposed. But in practice, after the council, this turned out to be quite impracticable. Mm. I mean, it created mm. so much, such holes in the Episcopal ranks, and they need bishops to send to Bulgaria. And so in practice, uh, th this was not, uh, not enforced. So, you know, it, it seems like there, there weren't many bishops who really attended 869. <laughs> it, it was poorly attended. So well, how can we talk about this being ecumenical? No, because, this, well, this, yeah. this, is, this is pretty startling. Uh -huh. Now, an ecumenical council is meant to be universal. Well, right. what sort of numbers do you expect in the early church? Um, Chalcedon. Uh, well, later claimed, what was it, 630 or something bishops, but that included a lot of names simply handed in by the bishops towards the end of the council. But we can say three seven, about 370. Mm -hmm. The second council of Nicaea uh, was, uh, had, had uh, 340 bishops attending. The council of 879 to 70, the later Pro Prussian council, had 380. Well, how many attended our council this evening? Well, the first session, you scarcely believe this, apart from the patriarchal representatives, there were 12 bishops. <laughs> well, as we uh, time passed, more joined them. At, at the eighth, the most important session of the council, when it really completed its work, they were up uh, to 37. <laughs> now, the final session, which was some time afterwards, it went up to 103. But mm. this is terribly unimpressive. Right. Now, um, why did so? Why were so few bishops ready to attend? Mm. I think one can deduce that the deposition of Phocius was 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 not popular. Mm -hmm. um, but um, my collaborator thought that the chief reason simply was rather the humiliation of a patriarch of Constantinople being condemned at a council. Uh, and and defrocked was simply hu uh, a humiliation that the, mm. the church the Byzantine church was extremely reluctant uh, to, uh, to 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 accept. Well, they were ready if the emperor wanted to push out um, uh, Phocius and put in Ignatius, they would have gone along with that. But a formal conciliar condemnation was clearly massively um, unpopular. Mm. I wonder uh, why. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Go now, ahead. That raised the question. If mm. the numbers are so few, how can it be considered ecumenical? Well, yes, I mean, it, it is a bit tricky. But 
what are the criteria? What makes a council ecumenical? I mean, this we have to repeat, particularly in the context of um, uh, of, uh, of Catholics, because we understand ecumenical mean the representatives from the whole church. Mm-hmm. Well, there never were at uh, the early ecumenical councils because over the overwhelming majority of bishops present were bishops from within the Byzantine Empire. Very rarely do have bishops from other parts of the east, from uh, east or south of the empire. Now, there are the papal legates, but they're not there in order to represent the Western church as a distinct geographical part of the church. They're there because the pope is accepted by everybody as the number one bishop, so he must be represented. Um, So what makes these councils ecumenical? Well, the answer is because they are summoned by the emperor, and it's the emperor who confirms their decrees and publishes them as imperial law. And the um, ideology of the Byzantine Empire, and and Rome was, um, well, although it it, it, it had been crowning some emperors in the West, uh, did not go go against this notion that the, the empire is is a god created christian rule over the uh, over over the world and the emperor of constantinople has uh worldwide authority uh in documents of the council of 680 to 81 you even find God described as the co-ruler with the Byzantine emperor. I mean, that we round. It is, it is startling. Um, and, as, and as late as um, uh, 1400, the Byzantine empire was reduced to Constantinople itself and some certain small parts of Greece. When um, the Tsar um, in Moscow de- uh, said that uh, declared that we have a, a church but not an empire, the Patriarch of Constantinople wrote, "Saints, nonsense! Of course, we have an emperor. He may not be widely recognised, but he is has God given authority over all Christians." Hmm. So. Um, now, but um, admittedly, now this Council of eight six nine seventy, they buttressed that by stressing something that, I mean, it was a, an old idea, but it now receives a, a neat degree of emphasis, stressing the mm-hmm. Pentarchy, who were present at the Council, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and legates from Rome and the three Oriental Patriarchates, Antioch, Jerusalem, and um, Alexandria. And huge stress, this is repeatedly mentioned. Well, other counts, they like having represented the Pentarchy, but it wasn't regarded even as essential. I mean, the um, uh, Iconoclast Council of 754 didn't have any papal or oriental representatives, and that didn't mm. worry people at the time. I mean, later, mm. of course, that council was rejected as heretical, but at the time, that was not felt an embarrassment. But um, so it's a bit artificial suddenly in 6970 to say, is it wonderful, you know, the Pentarchy, all five are in agreement, but that that they did is to bolster up uh, the chief consideration, which was that this was an imperial council. Well, and I have a couple of follow-ups with that, because mm. it seems like the Second Council of Nicaea talks about the Pentarchy as a standard for an ecumenical council. Mm-hmm. Um, could you briefly comment on that? Um, does it present? In fact, does it present the Pentarchy as a standard, or is it just kind of a misreading? Um, it does. I mean, I, I can't see it offers a sort of general doctrine about the Pentarchy, yeah. or, but it does repeatedly say, stress, that there are the, the representatives mm-hmm. uh, of the five um, chief jur- jurisdictions in the Christian church, mm-hmm. and, and this is seen as, well, manifested. This, this, this is, it's not an unreasonable claim to Eucumenisti that we may still feel mm-hmm. doesn't quite mm-hmm. make up for a council that only attended between most of the sessions between 12 and 40 bishops. I mean, this, this is, mm-hmm. seems a bit... Um, Bit inadequate, but they they ha- leap grab onto the idea of the pentarchy with, in order to try and bolster up uh, bolster up the claims. Mm. And, and one more follow up ca- um, mm. comment or question there. Um, so, as far as the Pope promulg, I'm sorry, <laughs> rephrase that one. The Emperor <laughs> promulgating a council and that makes yes. it ecumenical. Well, did did the Emperor immediately promulgate eight sixty nine? 
Um, ye yes, I mean, this is absolutely standard. The, the decrees mm -hmm. at the end of the Ecumenical Council, it was not the church that published them. It was mm -hmm. the emperor. This was absolutely standard, standard procedure. Mm -hmm. So uh, at least at that time, was it seen as ecumenical? I mean, at least right after promulgating 869, I, I guess, did the East well, see it that's, then? Well, that's a question. Um, what was its... Rep Rome, as I say, was disgruntled over Bulgaria, mm -hmm. above all, mm -hmm. and it didn't um, promulgate it. Mm -hmm. um, in the... As regards the three Oriental patriarchates, questions come up about how, how genuine mm -hmm. the, right. all these these legates were. Uh, right. I mean, this is a question raised about the Phocian councils, earlier ones in the 860s, uh, where he produced people claiming to be legates sent for Alexandria and Antioch. Well, some of them seem to be quite bogus. And sometimes, uh, after the patriarch himself was a Byzantine appointee living in Constantinople. I don't think that's true, 8697, because they... These are legates; they can't be. But um, how really authentic they were is 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 is, is a little little um, unclear. Well, let, let's talk about the the Roman legates there that, that you just mentioned. You know, can you now, talk? One, oh, go now, ahead. Now, one fascinating thing about this council is that mm -hmm. um, you know it, it it did the Roman will in uh, deposing, de uh, condemning Phocius. Mm in passing a canon saying that uh, it is quite improper for somebody to be elevated in a, almost a single leap from being a layman to being patriarch. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and the council itself was absolutely dominated by the Im imperial officials representing the emperor. He himself only made one short appearance. Uh, and the Roman legates acting together. In fact, I I Ignatius, who's now the recently restored patriarch of um, Constantinople, though he's constantly referred to with honor, actually spoke very little. He was a bit kept to the side. So the council is, in a way, a triumph for Rome. And yet the Roman legates uh, were quite unhappy about several features of the council. They were shocked at the very first session when they were asked to pr provide proof of their accreditation. Were they real, <laughs> genuine legates? And they were appalled. They said no Roman legates at early council has ever been asked to provide documentation of that kind. Now, more serious was the um, later on in the council, the fourth session, when the uh, imperial officials present demanded that Phocius and the bishops who had supported him be given the opportunity to defend themselves. The Roman legates protested, but they've already been condemned at the mm -hmm. Roman Synod of 863, and that's by the Pope above all. And this judgment was, is, has been final and complete. It was an insult to the Roman see to say that a new trial was necessary. They agreed to allow Phocius um, uh, to appear before the council, but simply so that he would hear the Roman verdict read out to him. Well, the council proceeded, however, to carry out a, a, a trial of Phocius, only concluded, fine, well, in the eighth session and then formalized at the tenth session. Uh, now, that formalization in the tenth century, they did say that we are. Um, uh, affirming and confirming the Roman verdict. But it doesn't, didn't change the fact that the council had judged itself competent, competent to hear an appeal against a Roman sentence, hmm. with the implication that our uh, ecumenical council was a higher court of judgment than, uh, than the papacy or a Roman council. And that was a claim which, since the time of Leo the Great, Rome had never accepted. Yeah, I mean, so so that this is kind of highlighting tension here between the legates and the Easterners. I, this seems to be something that comes up fairly often in ecumenical councils. Is that accurate? Um, this, but yes, I mean, this tension over where there has been a clear 
Roman pronouncement. Mm -hmm. And um, shall we say the uh, Pope Leo issuing his tome before mm -hmm. Chalcedon, mm -hmm. um, uh, where the Romans insist that uh, you know the, the, the final word has to be Roma locutores, Rome has spoken. You know, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And generally, the Byzantines don't dispute that because even though there is this continuing and constant disagreement about where a final authority lies in the church, in practice, the two sides want the same thing mm -hmm. and are passing the same judgment. So it isn't, uh, I mean, these councils is, isn't fatal. I mean, the, 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 both sides still collaborate. But it is very interesting that um, yeah. this collaboration um, there's a basic disagreement about authority that continues throughout it. In just one final follow-up there with the Roman legates, I, I just kind of wonder why did the Pope always send legates? Why wouldn't he just attend in person? <laughs> oh, now that now the standard invitation from uh, Constantinople from the Emperor of Constantinople was invite the Pope to come. Mm -hmm. it just, um, uh, we don't have the, the, the formal invitation in this case to some councils, but where we do, that is an absolutely standard thing that they say. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, popes, it's, you know, it, it's, it's quite, <laughs> nowadays a few hours flight, but I mean, then quite a, quite a sea journey um, mm. across but partially but dangerous waters mm. uh, and there's awful lot for popes to be, get, be getting down to in rome as well they you know you can understand that they they, they yeah much better that, than they get. <laughs> that makes sense so let, let's talk about later history here of the council especially concerning the investiture conflict with uh gregory the seventh well and, I mean, th yeah. this this is important because this is why where the council gets suddenly uh, re uh, remember, its memory is revived. Mm. You see, I've said already that Rome in 870 did not formally approve uh, the decisions of the council. And thereafter, it was forgotten, not surprisingly, um, until the famous investiture con controversy of the 11th to 12th centuries. Now, this is this is a bit of medieval church history most people know about, mm -hmm. that the dispute was that um, when a bishop is appointed, now he, um, he holds lands, he has jurisdiction, and is, at that point he was under the local ruler. Um, now, is he to be invested with the, his full Episcopal authority by the local ruler or by a church body, well, principally by the, 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 the Pope himself. Um, and later to this, too, is the question of who actually chooses the bishop. Mm -hmm. um, and Rome, what Rome wanted was uh, that uh, there's no question of lay investors in his church. Uh, a, a bishop should make an oath of fidelity to the ruler as regards his... his um, his lands, his sort of secular power, but in church matters, he should remain fully autonomous. And um, now, uh, it was the great, you know, the great uh, Gregory the the, the seventh, one, of the, you know, the great great uh, champion of the uh, uh, church line on this in about ten eighty, who <laughs> somebody must have. Well, perhaps he was learned. I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but somebody, but certainly he came across the acts of this council. And it was he who was the first person to call it the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Mm. Now, this is because now the canons of the council, now sadly, because the council was so soon rejected in Byzantium, its canons never entered the Eastern canonical tradition. But actually, I think they're a rather impressive set of canons. Um, I, I, I think they're better drawn up than those of Nicaea too. Or many of the Quinisex canons, but there it was. They, mm. they never became part of the Eastern tradition, but they were dug up, and particularly two canons in particular uh, were uh, singled out and now cited by Rome. One canon that says um, the elections of bishops by the suffrage and power of secular authority are in no way to be accepted. This is because you see, 
in fact, this is true of Ignatius, uh, the first uh, choice of Ignatius to be Patriarch, certainly true of when he was replaced by Photius. This is by imperial dictat. So that, um, uh, so this canon, you see, rules that out. And this, uh, not, uh, another canon, 22, the Holy Ecumenical Council defines, lays down, proclaims that law, the promotion and consecration of bishops takes place through an election and decision by the College of Bishops that no lay official or magnate should interfere with the election and promotion of a patriarch, metropolitan, or any bishop. Now, of course, that's interesting because it extends, it's not just talking about the patriarch, it's talking about uh, metropolitan bishops in charge of provinces and um, diocesan bishops. And clearly, um, it, there was quite a common experience that, that lay people would, um, lay magnets would effectively dominate the election. So um, uh, this clearly was already causing unease in uh, Byzantium, though the fact that the emperor essentially chose the patriarch was a, was a very well-established tradition. But it's because of those two canons, I think, that Gregory VII uh, wheeled out um, our council again, called it the Eighth Ecumenical Council, and of course it's enjoyed that status of, ever since. Right. Right. So now to the million dollar question that I'm sure everyone wants to know about, and that is, did Photius die in the peace of the church or was 869 just kind of the uh, final way in the eyes of Rome that he was seen? Um, well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, John the Eighth. Uh, the council at uh, council eight seven nine to eighty. From their first appearance, the Roman legates treated Photius as patriarch. Um, now they claimed that it was the, the Rome's decision to recognize him as patriarch that restored him. That he was therefore restored by the Rome's vice in eight seven nine, to which the Easterners at that council eight six seven nine to eighty said. But no, we've accepted him for years. Uh, they were not ready mm -hmm. to recognize that Rome's voice made any change. Um, uh, but, um, uh, and now as regards, now you see the, the, the people used to write about the second Phocian schism. Mm -hmm. According to this, and I haven't really explored this, I must confess, but I think it's what about even after 880. Uh, there's a fallout between Rome and Constantinople, and Rome um, condemns Photius again. Now, the, the view of, Byz of Byzantine historians is that this was a myth concocted by uh, people who, in subsequent decades, um, detested Photius's memory, and that this is really is a complete myth. And I think Dvornik, in his great study of 1948, really established that uh, beyond doubt. Yeah, because as I understand, there were some there was some kind of correspondence between the Pope and Photius, and in that correspondence, it seems like Photius is in communion. So it just seems like does, he dies yes. in the peace of the church. Okay. It, I think yes, I think that. Yeah. Um, so I have one more question before I ask you for some concluding remarks. It, it's something that I just thought of um, as we were having this discussion here. And it's in reference to, I believe it's Canon, yes, Canon 21 of 869. Uh -huh. um, if, if I can ask a, a specific question Please about do. it. It has something very curious where it says, at the end of the canon, if then any ruler or second secular authority tries to expel the aforesaid Pope of the Apostolic See or any of the other patriarchs, let him be. Oh, an yes. And, and then here's the kicker. Furthermore, if a universal synod is held and any question or controversy arises about the Holy Ch Roman Church, it should make inquiries with proper reverence and respect about the question raised and should find a profitable solution. It must on no account pronounce sentence rashly against the supreme pontiffs of old rome well, so my well yeah. my question here is does this concede that well the pope can be judged but just not rashly <laughs> well i no, you're, you're right i think this is a uh, very striking because you see the um this, of course, is in reference to the Phocian Council of 867, mm -hmm. not long before, that had condemned and, and <laughs> declared uh, the great Pope Nicholas um, 
uh, deposed and excommunicated. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> of course, what Rome would have liked would be a canon that said the, um, the Roman Pope cannot be condemned mm -hmm. at, um, uh, well, either by anybody, or he certainly can't be condemned by an Eastern Council. Mm -hmm. now, but clearly the, 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 the bishops and the government in Constantinople were not ready to concede that. Mm -hmm. So what they put together is this canon that is, you know, he's not to be judged rashly. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, effectively, it's resisting an adoption mm -hmm. of the Roman position that nobody can sit in judgment on, 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 on the Pope, unless possibly a Roman council. It, it sure does seem that way. So I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that the context or the understanding of that was that the Pope could be judged by a council, but only a council in communion with a later Pope judging a previous Pope. Is that correct or is that inaccurate? Well, <laughs> there's nothing of that in that canon, is it? Right, is, right. Uh, I think I, I, that's interesting. That now that's a further so to, um, <laughs> accepting this this canon, but then trying from the Roman point of view to remedy a bit. You say, well, because uh, you could have a problem. I mean, after all, there are were popes who um, got condemned posthumously. Mm -hmm. uh, who's is it? Fo Fo Moses. Who, who's the mm -hmm. one who gets? Um, uh, he, he gets dug out of his grave oh yes <laughs> put on right. trial you see right so uh, uh the, the situation could arise mm -hmm. um so um it, that is yes, perhaps pope can be condemned effectively only by his, uh, a later pope a not later by anybody pope. else yeah kind, kind of like in the case of honorius you know he, he's he's being condemned but after the fact and in union a council in union with a pope oh, oh, oh but that's true a norris yes um yeah. uh condemned as uh, uh indeed very much so mm -hmm. yes that's a good that's a good good parallel case yes but i could see how people would read that canon differently you know <laughs> I, I, I could see how some it's, would say it's, you know, it's it's a commit it's a canon produced by a committee you know yeah. <laughs> they can't make up mind. So they do something that really is bit yeah. pretty useless, isn't it? Very, right, very it is. <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, before we get to a few chat questions, if that's okay, just to mm -hmm. offer any concluding remarks on anything else that we didn't have a chance to cover. Yes. Um, well, I'd like to, I mean, just generalize. Uh, this council is very much, it's like, Many of the early ecumenical councils, Chalcedon, Constantinople III, and dividing, defining two wills and um, two um, operations in Christ, Nicaea II, in defining the images that are to be set up in churches and venerated. It's a case where Rome and the Byzantine church at that point is in very much in agreement. They meet together and they're very happy to sign together an um, uh, um, authoritative definition. But at the same time, there is no agreement as to where authority ultimately lies in the church. Mm. Uh, now, Rome attends these, these councils because it, liked, it would like to see orthodoxy in its, uh, you know, dominating in, in the East. And the East uh, is glad when Rome goes, is happy to collaborate because they share interest in um, a common Christian norms and rules and laws. Um, so th uh, the sense of two both belonging, even after Rome is set up at the Western Empire of the Franks, the sense that they belong still to this historical entity, the Roman Empire, the Roman world, remains very strong. But at the same time, and, and, uh, and generally the ecumenical councils, the, 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 yes, the two churches are, for a time at least, uh, in agreement, in alliance, yeah. mm -hmm. but where they never achieve a common understanding is over the question of where supreme authority lies in the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, go back to Chalcedon. Um, uh, Pope Leo, of course, welcomed, well, he, after a bit, not very enthusiastic to begin with, but he did then uh, uh, very formally support and right round supporting the definition of Chalcedon. But he always insisted his own tome was a document of even greater authority. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and you see the Council of 869 to 70, the Romans say Phocia has already been deposed. And the Greeks say, well, he hasn't actually. We've got to depose him before he's properly deposed. So, you know, so that, that was a tension at this council. The mm-hmm. Greeks wanting to have a formal trial and the Romans saying it's not necessary. Um, so this is very striking. Now, I mean, think, I thought struck me about modern ecumenism. Um, uh, uh, Pope Benedict the, 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 the 16th, when he was mm-hmm. still Cardinal Ratzinger, Mm-hmm. Um, at, um, uh, uh, made a speech saying that there's a need for us to study together uh, the constitution of the church in the first thousand years. Yes. Because after all, Rome and Constantinople are in communion, often collaborating. They must have had, you know, what did Constantinople uh, then accept about Roman authority? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can we be ready to, to, to demand any more? Well, if you're looking for a common agreement over authority, you won't find it. Mm-hmm. And why ecumenism basically flourished in this period was because the two sides worked together on Pacific questions. Mm-hmm. Now, I feel the same nowadays about ecumenical dialogue, that you try and think you might get some sort of agreement between mm-hmm. Rome and the Orthodox over pap- some sort of papal authority. I don't think that's the way to make progress. The way mm-hmm. to make progress would be the two sides to collaborate in mm-hmm. issuing documents and statements over the key questions of today. And in that sense, create this common activity, common interest. I feel myself that would be a better way ahead for ecumenism than the in, in, inevitably inconclusive uh, debates about authority in the church. And that, so that's one thing that I've, I've very been struck by recently, working on uh, putting together work on different councils. That's, that's one point I'd like to stress. Mm-hmm. The other thing is the... Um, Something which, of course, doesn't apply nowadays, but it's very important for these early councils. It's what does what is preserved of earlier literature and of earlier conciliar decrees. Um, you see, at um, uh, Constantinople 86970, they burn the decrees of the earlier Profocian anti-Roman council, particularly the one earlier in 867. Uh, then... Uh, after the uh, return of Phocius to authority, uh, the acts of our council, 86970, get destroyed. Um, and of course, regularly when the heretics are condemned, an order is issued that their works are going to be burnt. So there's a very definite attempt to create what is purely a selective memory, mm. that um, things in the past that were seriously erroneous you don't just want to condemn them, you want to eradicate the memory of them. Mm. Um, now, that wasn't really very successful with, well, it, was, it wasn't very successful with um, theological writings um, because, you know, you couldn't go around swooping, collect all the copies. <laughs> uh, if, if heretical works in the whole were lost, it was different. It was because the man, they weren't recopied, right. particularly after the switch from badger school to minuscule. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them were just left and, and, and rotted. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, this I found fascinating, this creating the memory of the church very carefully to uh, erase not only the, um, erase the memory of, um, of, uh, of false decisions, false doctrines of the past. So wouldn't that mean that we have a somewhat inaccurate or at least a, a deficient understanding of the past, if we kind of have this selective memory. Um, <clears throat> or do you think that we actually extent, do have a good impression of, of the past? Yes. I mean, well, I think historians have learned very much how, I mean, okay, heretical writings get destroyed, but the mm-hmm. writings were orthodox writers can, attacking, demolishing heretical writings survive. So you right. work from those. You see. Sure. Um, so, um, but it, it's, uh, uh, but, but uh, it's, it's true. Our knowledge of the past, we do not have, 
uh, the, the documentation is is not a, a full or impartial record. I mentioned this now, it's, this is a completely different world, but something that shot me quite deeply, I heard recently. Mm. When my country, Britain, gave independence to all those countries in Africa in the early 1960s, there, it was, of course, a vast amount of documentation about local gov government decisions, trials, and other matters. The instructions from Whitehall was that this documentation was to be destroyed because it might be used by later uh, historians who were exploring the British imperial past and showing things that had not been so attractive. <laughs> so millions upon millions of documents were simply incinerated. Now, this, hmm. is, it, this is 50 years ago. I mm -hmm. mean, for an historian, this is utterly shocking. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> so it goes on uh, even today. <laughs> it does go on even today, I'm afraid. Yes. There's um <clears throat> there's a good question here from Elijah Halber. He's asking about um, did the Council of 869 condemn the heresy that Christ had two human souls? Oh, yes, this did gosh. Uh, this this was a, a curious speculation of supposedly a focius that was dug up and condemned. Uh, it's very obscure to us what, what on earth is going on here, what focius meant and, uh, and what... Um, yeah, he, that, oh, he's well informed to bring that up. Yes, I hadn't been thinking of that one. It's, mm. it's, 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 it's not particularly prominent. John Kalarafi asks a question mm. about Photius at Florence or the Union of Press. Did Rome approve the veneration of Photius in the liturgical books? Do you know offhand? I don't, I'm afraid, no. Um, later Western memory of him has been uh, dominated by the fact he did actually have a pope <laughs> put on trial in Constantinople and condemned, um, that uh, he seems rather too much of a politician. And the myth of the Second Phocian Schism, um, which was created not by Rome, but by uh, people who still resented Phocian's memory in the East, but picked up mm -hmm. by Rome. So he's continued in the West to be regarded as a rather sort of brilliant but utterly untrustworthy and rather dubious oriental you know uh, the, the, you know he's he's um his his memory is is uh, people slightly shudder at the mention of his name but the fact is he is um um he's a very I, I, he's he's rather impressive at the council actually um you know Two sessions he was made to attend. At the first session, he was told, you see, that he was informed, you've been deposed, nor the rest of it. Do you accept your deposition? He just didn't reply. They went and pressed him. You must answer. Look, what do you think? What, what do you say of yourself? Until finally, Fosha said, even if I am silent, God hears my voice. The Roman legates responded, silence will not get you off condemnation, to which he replied, nor did Jesus escape condemnation by remaining silent. <laughs> and then was, after further pressure, he finally said, my just justification is not of this world. If it were in this world, you would behold it. I mean, <laughs> it's very impressive, you know, uh, imitation of Christ, if you like. But it's, it's, uh, I, you know, my, my respect for him increases um, <laughs> the way he conducted himself uh, uh, during this council. Here's a really good question here. For people who are interested in jumping into the councils of the first millennium and learning about them, what, what is some general advice? Where, where should they start? <laughs> <clears throat> Gosh, um, most languages have got some general book on the early councils that are perfectly adequate to start with. Um, gosh, I can't really think of one in, I think of good ones in German, Russian, 
um, French. Sorry, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you do probably people do want, uh, uh, yes, a sort of introduction that will give. But I mean, there must be plenty of those around. Just get get a basic picture in your head about uh, seven or eight councils or whatever you want, mm -hmm. want, to, want to include about basically what they're on about and what they thought. That should be quite easy um, from all sorts, all sorts of sources. <laughs> Even Wikipedia, you know, is, uh, has, has taken some trouble over that. <laughs> Beyond that, well, gosh, it's not for me really to plug my own work. But um, one thing that um, uh, people do appreciate is that <clears throat> to read the acts themselves, um, because they're very long texts, the fact is that most historians have not got the time to do so. Mm. And there have been that even people who one feels ought to know better, um, people who are, are church historians or recognized theologians, go on repeating hoary myths about councils because mm. they haven't at the time an inclination to read all those volumes and volumes published in Germany of conciliar acts. Mm. Um, and you know the typical German scholarly edition, you know, you've got the text, a critical apparatus, learned introduction about the manuscript tradition, but really assistance for the reader who just wants to get in what the council was about. It's not part of the traditional uh, scholarly edition of a text. Well, it's not really for me to advertise my own work, but I mean, the fact this is understood by, appreciated by people that I've been producing these translations with commentary of, um, we've now covered the great majority of these councils when the first one with Acts, which is Ephesus 1, now as we've got down to 869 to 70. Uh, there are two which are still on their way, 879 eight, to 80. Yeah. Here, now, this is, there isn't a uh, critical edition of the text. My collaborator, Federico Montinaro um, of Tübingen, he's producing the first critical edition of that, and I'm already working on that, translating it. And then hmm, another collaboration that's taken an awfully long time. Uh, to many people's like, irritation is that um, uh, the acts of Constantinople three, the yeah. anti monothelite anti monoenergist council, that is um, well advanced. I wish I could say it, it would come out in a year or two. I, I don't know when it will, but when that does, I think my 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 work. Well, my working way is complete. I rather run out of councils. You see. People don't really want you to translate councils which there aren't modern critical editions. Um, and I'm rather running out, to my regret. I, I, <laughs> how do I fill my days? You know? I'm, I'm really excited about the Sixth Council because I'm curious to see your commentary um, or your um, <clears throat> co-author's commentary on Agatho's letter to the emperor making papal claims at the council. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, again, that is not untypical. Absolutely. Um, uh, Rome does not write, uh, write to Constantinople saying, I'm marvelous you're hearing a great ecumenical council, you know, and uh, I, I would request this, that, and the other. Rome says, we have spoken, and the task of the council is to, opportunity of the rest of the church, to accept and acknowledge papal teaching. I mean, the same was true at Chalcedon. Um, um, yeah. Well, it's going to be fascinating, but you, you say it might be a few more years before I'm it comes afraid, out. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, maybe, <laughs> yes. Mm. <laughs> but after that, you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know what to translate after that. You were saying, what no, about I, the, the acts of the Council of Florence? I don't think those have well, been that, Well, that's true. Those haven't. I mean, that would be, uh, I mean, that'd be a vast, I suppose I'd, I'd need to find a team of collaborators on that. Um, of course, it's it's rather different body of material. Um, we haven't got to work complete sessional acts of the same kind. It's it's a whole mixture of accounts and documentation and all the rest of it. But uh, yes, I think it would be very useful if that was very. translated with um, <laughs> with a good commentary. So if they, I was they, younger, I suppose I, I probably might might embark on that. I've read, read parts of them. They're, they're, um, they're, 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 it's a very interesting... Um, it, it was frankly a rather unequal debate at Florence. Um, the Greeks were in a weaker position for two reasons. One was that, of course, they were politically desperately in need of Western support rather than West needing 
uh, support of Constantinople. And the other thing was that the, um, you know, by that date, Rome, Western, the Catholic theology got a lot of things very neatly tied up, while Byzantium hadn't. So when, for example, at Florence, the question arose about the doctrine of purgatory. Now, the, right. the, the, the Byzantines didn't like the uh, Catholic doctrine of purgatory. They thought it was newfangled. But when they were asked, what do you think happens after right. they, they didn't have a single answer. There wasn't an established mm -hmm. orthodoxy on that. Um, uh, and of course, when, when uh, uh, appeal was made to the early uh, Latin fathers whom Constantinople recognized, of course, the Romans could cite all sorts of texts. And the Easterners had no means of being no, certain whether they were authentic, what the context was. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the Greeks were rather a bit lost out at Florence. The pressure on them to yield to... Um, because they desperately needed Western help. It was, it was a sad event in that way. It wasn't a proper uh, equal debate. Mm. Mm. Well, if you <clears throat> ever get bored and you don't know, you know, what to do with your time, maybe <laughs> maybe working on that would be would be a good one because we would all love it and appreciate it. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> well, we we desperately need it right now. We have uh, gill, basically just gills. Um, <clears throat> account of the council yes. points, Joseph Gill. Hmm. Um, no, I think uh, one with one, one with with um, um, Eastern Orthodox uh, collaboration. So it was a properly mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, interchurch um, uh, endeavor. Uh, Gill, yes, he <laughs> <laughs> good, for excellent, superb scholar, but rather old-fashioned Catholic in many ways. <laughs> Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, looks like there's one more question here. Right. At, at the beginning, if I heard correctly, does Father Price believe that 879 wasn't fully accepted by Rome? Um, no. Um, well, in one way, not fully. Uh, I mean, the, what, the work of 879 to 80 was fairly slight. I mean, essentially, it's simply recognizing Photius as patriarch and condemning those in the East who were still uh, denying his authority. And, of course, Rome agreed with that. But Rome had itself spoken on this matter. You see, the, the legates arrived from Rome at 879 saying, uh, the matter has been resolved. The, the, the Pope accepts Photius. This is the decisive judgment, you see. So in Roman eyes, the Council of 879 to 80 adds, adds nothing. It represents the East accepting with gratitude the Roman judgment. <laughs> of course, the East said, no, we aren't accepting the Roman judgment. We're going by our own judgment. Unfortunately, Rome has finally got, right, got round to agreeing with us. <laughs> so no, R Rome had no reason to, um, uh, to attach uh, a status to that uh, to that council, and one now one thing that is I just got kind of looking at the um, Acts of eight seven nine to eighty. Uh, at all sessions, it starts off with Photius being described as the president of the council, mm -hmm. and he is named before the Roman legates. Now, in all earlier councils, the only president was the emperor. And when he attended, he was the, he presided. He was formally called the president, Procathemon or whatever. Um, and uh, when he wasn't present, um, there was a pecking order for bishops, you know, and, and the list, uh, you know, uh, uh, councils attended by, and then of course the senior bishops would come, legates would come first. But uh, the term president was reserved to the emperor. And then standard in all these councils. Um, when you have the list of the people who approve the decrees, the um, person will come at the top, you have the papal legates, and then you have the patriarch of Constantinople, and then the other patriarchs or legates from the world. But in this act of this council, Photius's name always precedes that of the papal legates. Now, you know, uh, so... Uh, no, it's not a council that Rome can really <laughs> look, up, look at with much uh, uh, satisfaction. Hmm. I didn't know that. So, so Photius is first, and then the papal legates. Yes, it's first wow. time. You see, it's very irregular. 
Uh, wow. It's one of, one, of, one of those mixed feelings about Fosius. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been re- reading his Amphilochia, which is a, um, a collection of letters, extracts and letters that he wrote to people at request of all sorts of biblical and theological questions. And his erudition is startling. And he gives a very clear exposition of a rather difficult, difficult doctrine, Maximus the Confessor on will in Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Fosius is, it, it really is, uh, he's an in, enormously impressive intellectual figure. Uh, and as I say, if I, he comes across from the Council of 697 uh, as being a brave figure with dignity. Uh, you know, I think one must re- uh, respect him. <clears throat> There, this is something that I just saw that came up. It's somewhat unrelated, but I'm really curious to know as well. Do you happen to know about why don't we have the acts of the Lateran councils and uh, the Leon's council? Well, you see, um, uh, what councils actually issued acts? After all, the first th- three ecumenical councils did not... Well, Ephesus is a bit special because it never met together uh, Ephesus one as a single body. There were always two split councils, and they produced documentation. But um, but neither side um, produced um, substantial records of conciliar sessions, and there are no were no such acts for Nicaea one or Constantinople one. Um, so. Um, no, I'm sorry, in my ignorance, my narrow concentration on this small area, um, I'm not sure what the, I, I think, I'm not sure we, I don't think we generally do have acts of the, of the kind we do for, from Ephesus 1 down to 870. I don't think we do have acts of that kind for, for medieval councils. Hmm. I wonder if that means that they weren't really at that time perceived as ecumenical, or does that not logically follow? Well, no. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, there were, what was received as being important was their decrees, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> and the question of what you uh, what should otherwise should go in the acts is, and, and of course, one thing I I mean, I think now a rather impressive thing about eight six nine to seventy is that my impression reading these acts is that they are pretty complete. There are no obvious holes or omissions. And if so, that's the first acts of an ecumenical council, which is true. All the earlier ones I've worked at is manifestly that the record is selective and uh, a silence is imposed on various aspects of the council's discussion. I wonder if that's evidence against conciliar fundamentalism, the idea that everything even in the acts is infallible. I oh, believe well, that's so, the term well, you've used. Uh, yeah. uh, so, oh, absolutely, yes, indeed. I think, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, um, they're a record to be used with an awareness that they're rather curious. Is they a bit of a halfway house? I mean, they weren't widely circulated. So they are an official record, but yet they are a selective record. Hmm. Um, propaganda in that sense, but propaganda is not widely circulated. I've been working at... Um, a genre called uh, conciliar synopses, which are um, uh, accounts that go through all the councils, you know, from <laughs> Nicaea down to whatever, you know, down to um, uh, Nicaea too, and uh, give you information about everyone. Um, virtually none of them show knowledge of the conciliar acts that I've been studying. Mm. They just were not generally available, were not studied, were not read. Huh. So they're rather curious, a sort of form of document. And you can understand why other councils earlier or later, or of course all the all the local councils, uh, did not issue uh, comparable records. Hmm. Um, Father Price, you told us that you have some other books coming out. Eight, 879, I think you said, is, is coming out. Um, is there anything that we can look forward to in the near future? Not, uh, not near future. No, 879 okay. to 80. Um, my collaborator's got to complete his critical edition of the mm-hmm. text. Okay, um, no problem. And mm-hmm. I, I say Constantinople 3, well, yeah. keep your fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, what, what councils have we not... Um, well... Yeah. Yes. Maybe you can give us a maybe you can give us a sneak peek in, in an article or or a show or something like that. <laughs> Perhaps. Well, to fill up my time. I've been writing a whole yeah. series of articles more generally about councils, 
Um, it's awfully easy for me, having studied most of them individually in turn. Um, are, are they available right now? For us oh, to read? Uh, no, well, sometime before they come out, but they're, okay. they're uh, on their way. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll look forward to that. I, I love reading everything that you put out. So, <laughs> in fact, we all really, you know, every every pretty much everybody who watches this this show regularly. Enjoys well, uh, words, yes, so. I, I think. <laughs> My stuff is easier to read than some other academic stuff. I'm not, I'm not, I'm aware with the very best of my collaborators, the better scholars than I am, uh, with uh, acuter judgment and a control of a greater body of material. But I think my stuff is quite straightforward. Intelligible. Accessible. It's very accessible. accessible. So which, I feel like, which, and quite concise too. Um, with, we're we're all grateful for the accessibility, by the way. <laughs> it, it helps us. Like I said, no, I did. I, one reviewer did comment on one of my translations that my vocabulary and syntax were too complicated for modern students. Uh, who said that? I, I slightly cringed. At, I mean, I I think I know who's getting at. There was a time when I did use rather archaic words. Uh -huh. A favorite of mine. Now, when you say a decree or document is unbreakable you mustn't infringe uh -huh. you what word do you use you can't say unbreakable we don't use that right. for right so i dug up the word irrefragable <laughs> now i don't think that is in general usage no usage <laughs> um, but it's just a problem you see after these texts they're written in uh i mean they're not desperately rhetorical but you know they've got complicated syntax mm -hmm. a large site sometimes recon recondite uh, vocabulary how do you translate those you can't translate that into an english that is comprehensible by an eighteen-year-old, I'm afraid. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, and and how many eighteen-year-olds are really reading this stuff? Is my question. Well, I, I, I I'm quite. I, I, I no, it, it's not intended for them. It's intended. Yeah, right. I, I'm thinking of uh, postgraduates or for scholars sure. who. I mean, one of my fears is that people read Price and don't bother to go back to the original Greek and Latin, um, and it is a worrying. A huge amount of translations appear, and they do enable people to pose as scholars, but they don't do the basic work on studying the languages. Mm. Now, that, that really I find very uns... Uh, fine, I'm not saying you should, only people who know Greek and Latin should read my stuff. It would be ridiculous. Right. But um, uh, people should be aware that to do first-rate scholarly work, you know, whatever translations are coming out, learning the language is... And getting into the feel, the style of the diction, you know, it's it's part of exploring the ancient or, or medieval worlds. What I'd like to think is that what I'm particularly aiming at in producing these translations is people who do have an interest in some aspect of a council or some general question. And they'd like to look what the Acts have to offer, but they don't have time to read through the whole text in the original Greek. I mean, I'm that's yeah. a terribly good linguist. I can't read through this stuff with speed. Mm -hmm. and so I hope my translation, they can skim through it rapidly, mm -hmm. speed reading, and then they find something that is useful, important for them, then I hope they'll be able to go and look at the, the Greek or Latin. Um, uh, they haven't got to be brilliant Greek or Latin scholars. Obviously, they've got my translation, to, which is pretty literal to assist them. But that, that is my hope, that my... Yeah. translations increase <laughs> access to the greek and latin texts rather than <laughs> replace the yeah. greek and latin that, texts that that makes sense because mm. what i'm saying is some people who who don't know latin and don't know greek sitting in judgment of works like yours mm. and yet they they don't know the original languages so i think the the yeah. original intention however of works like yours is just to make it a little bit more accessible exactly but not yeah. to replace not the skill replace, of learning it. Place, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For for me, my my impression is if somebody is going to you know uh, sit in judgment of somebody's work like a translation, they need to also be able to handle the original sources themselves. Yes, they, yes, yeah. they do. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point, mm -hmm. Doctor Price and, and Father Price. I should say thank you so much for coming on. Well, well thank you. This. I mean, I'm delighted to, um, <laughs> to have <laughs> have some. Keen, keen readers, and, and, and you're saying that you know people as in your own country, uh, quite a lot of people take an interest in this council, which I really hadn't been aware of. I'm delighted to think that my work does um, uh, uh, in, uh, interest people, and it does. of course, they'll be well aware that um, 
I'm an historian. I'm not right. a theologian. I'm not. I haven't got some ecclesiastical, ecclesiological axe to grind. Mm -hmm. um, Which I think is helpful because, and and I think that's why a lot of people um, really enjoy your work. As I said, a lot of people who I encounter are not only Catholics but also Orthodox and some Protestants, mm -hmm. like Anglicans, really enjoy reading your your works. So. Um, I, I, I do appreciate the fact that you're coming at it from the perspective of a historian because it, it, it makes it accessible to all of us and everybody feels like they can glean <laughs> from it. So it's not just a Catholic necessarily um, no, translation, no, but, no, but no. it's a hit. Yeah. So mm -hmm. once again, thank you so much for coming well, on. Thank Always you very much for, for inviting me. It, it, and would we be able to have your blessing, Father? Yes. Mm. What language? Well, that's it. <laughs> uh, benedictio uh, Domini Dei descendat super vos et omnes cum amore Christo et inspirazione Spiritus Sancti. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you all and remain with you always. Thank you so much, Father. Always an honor. And everybody, thank y'all for watching. Don't yes, forget indeed. to Many thanks. Yeah, share share this on your social media and hit that subscribe <laughs> button. So <laughs> that'll do it. We'll see y'all later. God bless. Yes.